Good morning, students. Welcome to the hand lecture, the live lecture, and thanks for joining. I want to give special thanks to Jessica Land and Lauren Hepworth and because they have also contributed in the past number of years to this lecture. If you have any questions, do type it in the question and answer section and I will get back to you as soon as possible. So enjoy. I'm just trying to move to the next slide. I think if you click on the slide, um, it should go over automatically. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. So yeah, let's start to orientate ourselves to the areas of the hand of what we are talking about. So where's your volar palmar side of your hand? And where's your dorsal side of your hand? So if you look at your palm, that's quite obvious now. It's where you see your fingerprint side as well as the lines. That is called the volar or palmar side. If you turn your hand um, around, if you pronate it, and you look at the nail side, that's the dorsal side of the hand. Now moving on to the ulnar, or the medial side. Remember, we are looking at the anatomical position. So the anatomical man position, where they stand with their thumbs outward. So the ulnar side is where the ulnar bone runs. And the radial side is on the side where the radius bone is. Lateral as well. When we count fingers, we start with the thumb as number one, and up to the little finger number five. So why is this important? Often you will see that when you read um, your patient's records in the hospital, that they often talk about thumb, index finger, but there are times when they talk about the fifth metacarpal head, or the fifth metacarpal neck fracture, something like that. And then you will know what they are talking about. But when you document, always use right thumb, right index finger. Flexor zones, so what are these? If you've looked at the, the flexor tendon rehabilitation um, YouTube video that I sent to you a day or two ago, you will then know where the flexor zones are. But just to remind you again, I've added the picture at the top right. So you can see zone one is at the DIP levels. So basically from where the FDS insertion, distal to the FDS insertion. That is zone one. Zone two is from that line up to the metacarpal heads, zone two. Zone three is from your metacarpal heads to the distal border of the carpal tunnel. Zone four is the actual carpal tunnel. Zone five is then in the forearm. You will see also interesting is that the thumb has its own zones, the T1, T2 and T3. So why do we need these zones? When you have a cut, for instance, let's think of a person working in a factory using a grinder. And they, the grinder injures them in zone two in that region. Then it is easy to record and communicate to where exactly the injury is. You will also see this when you observe where the actual scar and the laceration was. So this just makes it very handy when we communicate to each other. Extensor zones. If you look at the picture on the right 
bottom, the colorful one, you'll see that the extensor zone is on the dorsal side. And it moves from one over the DIP crease, two over the middle phalanx, three over the PIP, four over the proximal phalanx, five over the metacarpal heads, six on the dorsum, seven over the carpal tunnel, and eight forearm. So the easiest way to remember this is that the uneven numbers are lying over joint creases. So also, also good for you to know. So what's the difference between extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles? So extrinsic muscles, you often want to think that they are lying on the outside. Who thinks that? The outside of the hand? And the intrinsic muscles are just deeper to that. Well, in actual fact, is what extrinsic muscles mean, and I'm sure many of you have know this already, it lies outside the hand, meaning your forearm, your, your long forearm extensors and your wrist extensors, where your intrinsic muscles are the muscles inside the hand. For instance, the interossea that adducts, adducts the fingers, as well as the lumbrical muscles, thena, hyperthena muscles, they are all intrinsic muscles. Usually your smaller muscles. So remember you have your intrinsic flexors, extensors, and not just extensors like I mentioned. Okay, let's move on. Terminology. Let's run through certain joints and areas just to familiarize yourself. If you have your... Uh, uh, Mrs. Keller, uh, apologies. Yes. Uh, some of the students are struggling to log in. Okay. Um, um, I just did in the chat uh, that they're struggling to log in. Um, so I'm not no. sure if it's WhatsApp the link or something. Um, you can... Let's see. I've, I've WhatsApp it to Ronnie. I think he shared it already. Um, but the lecture is recorded, um, so it will be available afterwards. Yeah, sorry about that. That's a, um, but it will it will be available afterwards. Are they in the waiting area, Amanda? Um, no, there's only 16 attendees at the moment that we can see. Um, and then there was just somebody who said in the chat anonymously. Oh, it was Ronnie who said, some students are struggling to log in. Um, so I'm not sure who they are, but uh, we can load the lecture uh, somewhere where they can look at it afterwards. All right. Um, and it means that they have the correct link um, if 16 of them are joining already. So um, yes. maybe it's connect connectivity on this side, um, but I do hope they can join soon. Okay. Uh, will we will we proceed? I think so. I just wanted to make you aware. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. Stop me anytime. Okay. If there's anything, please let me know. So terminology-wise, where's your car radial carpal joint? So if you think about your radius, move your hand down on the radius down to the hand, and where it hits the carpal bone. That is the radiocarpal joint. So you know that the radius is part of that, as well as the scaphoid and lunar bones. That's the articulation, and that's where most of your wrist flexion and extension happens. So where's your TFCC? Triangular fibrocartilage complex. So if you now move on your ulnar side, you move your fingers on your ulnar bone, try to touch, touch your ulnar bone up to the wrist. You get to the carpal bones and you feel that there's a soft 
area that you can actually lift up. That is your TFCC, almost like a hammock, a fibro cartilage supportive area on that side. It can get injured, but it is very tough. So it, um, what they do is they um, inject radioactive dye, and if it flares up, they can see that there's a disruption, and then the dye will move into the interosseous space. That means that there's a tear of the TFCC, just for interest's sake. Copper metacarpal joint of the thumb. So we know that it's close to the thumb. It's where your carpal bone is and where your first metacarpal joint of the thumb is. What is the condition that we very often see in our older population, especially with our females? What do we see at the CMC joint? Isn't it osteoarthritis? Yes, it's osteoarthritis at that joint. So when you palpate it, you will actually, it will be painful. And there's also a grinding test where you push the metacarpal down and it will flare up. Where's your drudge joint? Distal radial ulnar joint. So, you know, often if there's a distal, there's a proximal. So proximal radial ulna is at the elbow. But if you move your hands down the radius and the ulna, down, down, down to the wrist, it is just before the carpal bone start. That is where your drudge joint sits. What movement happens here? Pronation, supination? Exactly. So the ligament supporting this joint can get injured, and then you will have more movement of the ulna. So you can actually move the ulna, and if you press it, and there's more movement compared to the other side, that's a positive piano key sign. Interesting. Huh? Where is your NCPJs, metacarpal phalangeal joints? Yes, they are just below your carpals. If you run down the big bones of your hand and you reach your knuckles, that's where your MCPJs are. If you move your fingers down from there, PIPs, proximal interphalangeal joints, and then your DIPs, the very distal joints of your thumb. So what can our hands do? If you observe what your hands are doing in a, let's say, waking hours, let's say 16 hours a day, we will be astonished at how many things we do. For an example, use our cell phones. Have you seen how skilled your hands is to hold it? Thumbs, maximum precision. Um, in the old days, in the older days, we used our index finger, some, sometimes still. Or when you typed your exam last Friday, your fingers, you used your index fingers probably a thousand times, right? So here is a very comprehensive grasp table for you by Fix et al. And they did research and found that you have power grasps, intermediate and precision grasps. And then they went further and divided it into where the thumb is abducted. So it's grasping, the thumb is used to grasp or where it is adducted. All right, so if you move your thumb away from your index finger, that's abduction. Adduction is close to the index finger. So when you observe your clients as a tip in your evaluation, pick out a few, like your palmer pinch or your large diameter grasp, your adductive thumb, a hook, and look if any of these graphs are present or absent. And remember always in any orthopedic patient that you see that we first have to know what happened during the injury. This is important. 
Because if you don't know the mechanism, have a good history, um, know what the plan of the doctor is, followed by if you can proceed with active mobilization, or if there's a period of, of immobilization, we can be dangerous and we don't want to do that, right? So make sure that before you ask them to do any grasps or any active movements, that you know exactly what is expected, what's the protocol. If they need to immobilize the joint, you can assess above and below, but just make sure. So I thought this is a very handy, handy tip to keep you. So now, what we're going to do, the objectives of our lecture is to showcase the hand. And we're going to look at common hand injuries that are frequently sustained, and then go on to the evaluation of the hand. So it's not an exhaustive PowerPoint of all the um, injuries, but the ones that you will often find. So the first one we start with is neurovascular injuries. Who of you, who of you have done a mountain bike race of, let's say, Saturday and Sunday, got home and couldn't actually wash your hair or hold a hair dryer? Has this happened to any one of you? Well, <clears throat> that is a neurovascular injury. You know from your previous peripheral nerve lectures that you had that there are different types of nerve, peripheral nerve injuries. The first, least severe, a neuropraxia, followed by an axonotmesis, and then a, if it, the nerve is completely severed, a neurotmesis. So here, we are talking about a neuropraxia. It's usually a chronic nerve entrapment rather than just an acute episode. That means it's over, over months and over, um, not just a single day, compared to when there's been a cut, a cut in the forearm with a bottle, and the ulnar nerve has been severed, a neuropraxia that was an acute episode. So let's look at two. Let's look at Guyan's neurovascular injury and the carpal tunnel. So in the Guyan's canal, on the bottom right hand side, you can see how the ulnar nerve enters into the hand. It is quite a, people often say, a treacherous path into the hand, and very fancy, because it moves around the hook of the hammock. And you can see the fiber osseous canal that it actually has to run through. So this is where the ulnar nerve can get entrapped at the wrist with repeated blunt trauma or like your hands in the drops of your handlebars on your road bike or when there's edema. It normally settles with rest. And splinting can also help if it does not settle with rest for approximately four weeks. And surgery is not, not indicated normally for these clients. You can also see there's an ulnar nerve fallout. What deformity will our clients present with? And that is the picture on the bottom left. Who can tell me what hand is that? A claw hand. Can you see that the medial two fingers has lost flexion at the MCPJs? And it looks like a claw hand. But this hand, actually, if you look at it, almost looks like there might be a median nerve. Can you see that the thumb is sitting at the side? Can be voluntary. Also, there's a bit of atrophy on the thinner and the hypothenar eminence. Carpal tunnel. Let's move on to the carpal tunnel. So it's an entrapment of 
a very popular nerve, meaning the median nerve, and it's most common. People often present with this. It is when there's an increased pressure underneath the transverse flexor carpal ligament, and that is the most superficial border or part of the carpal tunnel as a result of synovial thickening. So the clinical test that you can do is your phalus, where you flex your wrists 90 degrees, elbows up, and then push your hands together. Hold that for 10 seconds, and if there's pins and needles, numbness, then stop, and it's a positive carpal tunnel um, neuropraxia. Then you let the person just rest a little bit for, for a few seconds, 10 seconds. Then the reverse phalanx is the praying test with your wrist extended. So what is the treatment? Treatment is can be cortisone injected into the area, splinting for four weeks, at night especially. That is when the pressures also build up, your body relaxes, and there is an increased pressure as well in the carpal tunnel, often seen with pregnant women. How can we help them? Well, if it's been long standing, then you know that the, the hand muscle supplied by the median nerve will be atrophied. Um, so you can work on that, maintaining ROM, kinesio taping over the carpal tunnel, neural glides, and if no response, then a carpal tunnel release will be done. Arthroscopic carpal tunnel release is also um, being done. There's, there's a, they say that there can be a few complications, but I've also seen very good results because you don't have the, the scar, but just the arthroscopic holes. And after surgery, scar massage is very important. Your neural gliding to be commenced very gradually, not into pain. Remember, nerves we always take care of. Do not, do not flare up the clients. You can even start with the components away from the actual carpal tunnel. Start with your neck. Start with your elbow. Now we move on to another injury that often happens. is the collateral ligament injury. The mechanism is when there's a lateral force directed at the PIP. It forces an ulnar or radial deviation, as you can see in the picture. It's very common, especially in our cricket players or netball players, where they actually often catch the ball just, just in the um, just on the tip of the finger, and then that lateral force occurs. When you evaluate a finger like this, you can often know that the collateral may be in trouble, injured, if it's painful over the PIP on the sides where the collateral is. It's often very painful to touch, and this injury swells for a long time. So you will see the swelling in the region of the PIP. You have to evaluate it actively. So you have to ask, close your, make, make a fist, and you look at what that finger does. Is it, is it deviating to a side, ulnar or radially? Then you also have to passively test the stability. The passive stability test is tested in 30 degrees of flexion, while the MCPJs are flexed to 90 degrees. What happens if you test it in an extended MCPJ? It will tighten all the intrinsic muscles, all your interosseae, all your lumbricals, and so you won't get a pure result. So there's other forces. So to take away those other muscles, 
out of the equation. We flex the MCPs to 90. You can, you can try it on your own finger now. You flex the PIP to about 30, and then you place a force where you want to open up the PIP on both sides. So what do we always do is we compare to the unaffected side. Then you will get a true reflection of what is normal for your client. So we said it can happen in sports, falls, motor car accidents, or even fingers jammed in a car door. Ouch. So what's the treatment for this? A grade one where there's only a few fibers, no visible dislocation, only a few fi fibers injured, perhaps some laxity, but no active difference in the finger. When you ask them to actively flex, it looks fine compared to the other one. Then you body strap it and careful return to play and activity with the body strapping. This is where often the player can go back onto the field, they body strap, um, or make a faster return to sport with the body strap one. With a grade two, this is a more severe injury, but still there can be an active and a passive um, difference in that finger, but no clear dislocation or subluxation. So more than about half of the, the ligaments or the collateral is damaged. Body strapping for a longer period, six to eight weeks. So we allow this finger to rest. Inverting your body strap or a static extension finger splint, starting with slight flexion. So, this is where the splint is on the volar palmar side, and the finger rests and heals up. A grade three, there's a clear laxity. If you're passive test, active test, you can see that that finger is deviating to one side. And there's also a chance of a possible volar plate. That's the plate at the um, volar side of the finger or even a part of the bone. So here they need to fix it surgically. Open reduction internal fixation. Full extension to let that joint heal up for five to six weeks as well. Now let's move on to phalangeal fractures, fractures of the bones of the fingers. Very few deforming forces, possibly only in your proximal phalanx, as you can see in the middle picture. But the thing is, these clients are, their fingers are hypersensitive. And you actually have to work through all your fine coordination movement, retraining of sensation, Remember the, the digital nerves run closely on both sides of each finger. So also proprioception, you know, close your eyes, where's your finger now? You have to add this in your rehabilitation. Treatment, immobilization for three weeks in a splint as demonstrated in the picture below. That is a static finger extension splint. Interesting, the sharp fractures of the middle phalanx take longer to heal than the proximal phalanx due to the, the slight difference in vascular supply. Close proximity of the flexor tendon sheath to the bone, so adhesions is possible. So do go and look at the flexor tendon rehabilitation um, it's just too long, I couldn't include it in here, but you will then see how close the flexor tendon sheath is, tendon and its sheath is to the bone. So we have to take this into consideration to prevent adhesions. And that's what also why the surgeons will fix this fracture very soon. Let's go on to our thumb. So injury that can happen with your thumb, who of you have skied in the, in the Alps 
or in Afriski. So where I have never skied before, um, although I'm sure we all would love to do it. But this is the injury that's called the skier's thumb. Years ago, it also got the name gamekeeper's thumb, indicating how they used to um, slaughter their rabbits with the thumb movements. So yeah, let's, let's stay with skier's thumb. Um, that is the ulnar collateral ligament injury that can happen when you fall with your ski pole in your hand. And that ski pole places a lateral force at the joint of the thumb that you can see below. Remember, um, I see now it's PIP, but in the thumb, we talk about an interphalangeal joint because it doesn't have a PIP and a DIP. It's the IP, and what we are talking about here is a lateral force at the MCP of the thumb. It can also happen in rugby, cycling, horse riding, fall on an outstretched hand. With your examination, there will be tenderness and pain on the ulnar side of your MP. And also, the thumb is moved into 30 degrees of flexion and there's a force placed to stress that ligament. Can you see that the ligament being tested, the ulna side is closest to the little finger. That's why it's ulna. On the other side, where the lady's index finger is, that will be the radial collateral ligament. So that side can also be injured, but not as often as the ulna side. But then you would just move the force if they complain of pain in that side. You'll just move the force and open the joint into the different direction, always compared to the other side. So treatment of an ulnar collateral ligament injury or skier star. If there's a complete tear, it will require an operation within three weeks. So the earlier they go to the surgeon and hospital, the better for this injury. Then splinting for six weeks in a thumb splint like you can see at the bottom. You see that the, the wrist is not included here because it is just the M MCP joint where the ligament is injured. For conservative management, they see that the ligament only a few few fibers a grade one or two injury then it's splinted the same splint for three to six weeks but however if it's a late presentation and it's a chronic instability there will be pain and pinch weakness let's go on to the decor veins who have you have ever heard of a decor veins Tenosynovitis. Well, this is where the first compartment of your extensor compartments, we'll look at it now, but it's where your extensor pollicis brevis tendon and your abductor pollicis longus tendon. As indicated in the picture on the right, where it becomes inflamed at the tendons and where the synovial sheets are encasing them. You see that blue areas. So this can happen in racket sports. You use your wrist very often, weightlifting, but pregnancy as well. If you think about how a mom will pick up her baby, she will use her fingers and her thumb and then do an ulnar deviation. So it's repetitive, the mechanism of injury is repetitive wrist movements and also using your APL and your APB. So now we're going to look at the compartments of the extensor tendons. So this is now on the dorsal side of your wrist. You're looking at your fingernails and let's move through 
what's in the different compartments starting at one? We've now just heard that the abductive pollus is longest, extensive pollus is brevis, sits in the first compartment. What is in your second compartment? Your second compartment is your wrist extensors and radial deviate, deviation muscles. That's your extensor carpi radialis longus and your extensor carpi radialis brevis. Interesting, another condition that can happen between your compartment one and two is a friction about four centimeters proximal to the carpal level. You see, this is where the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis compartment two overlies compartment one. And it's a friction in that area. So if your client is complaining of pain, but it's not as low as a deco veins, it's a little bit more proximal, and it lies over those tendons, it's called an intersection syndrome. Yeah, because that's where they intersect. And it's the friction that happens there. Compartment number three, extensor pollicis longus the long extensor of the thumb. Four, extensor digitorum communis, extensor indices. Five, extensor digiti minimi, your little finger. And six, extensor carpi ulnaris. So a mouthful, but this will help you going into our next injuries. Can you see with your Compartment number four, your extensor digitora. Your tendons move towards your fingers and then they go into past the transverse fibers and into your dorsal expansion. And this is where we'll show you the anatomy of the finger in a bit. So here is now, we talk about your extensor mechanism. This is now from your extensor digitorum communis into the finger. How does the tendon, the EDC, run into the finger? Let's follow it. Let's look at the picture. Central slip. Can you see the central slip? So that's your EDC. So the central slip gets supported by the sagittal bands. It's almost like an encasing. It just says, okay, I'm here to support you. Sagittal bands. It runs distally, it runs distally, and it inserts into the middle phalanx. There it gets another body, another supporter, your oblique retinacular ligament. If we don't have these two supporting sagittal band, oblique retinacular, the ligament, the tendon will glide from side to side. And we don't want this because this is a closed back area in the finger. What then happens? There's this, a slip that then moves distally. And that is, so it's basically lateral bands from your central slip and it inserts your terminal slip inserts into the most distal part of your DIP. Can you also see how the muscles insert your interosseous coming from the sides, your lumbrical muscle, and they also insert into the finger on the sides. Remember I told you that's why we need to flex the MCP and the PIPJ when we test for instance, like the collateral ligament. So go back to this picture and just see how beautifully the finger is ma made. On the palm of Ola's side, that's where your FDS runs and then your FDP, your flexor tendons. So what extensor injuries do you, can we find? We're going to go through each one of them. We can find an injury at the terminal slip, 
you look at the picture on the right hand side, terminal slip. We can have an injury at the lateral slip, of oh, the central slip. Can also, the lateral bands can migrate a bit and actually have deformities of the fingers. Let's take a look at these individually. The mallet finger. The mechanism of injury is a forced flexion on your DIP on an actively extended finger. So this is now where the ball comes. Somebody's throwing the ball to you, you're a netball player, and it hits you directly on the tip of your finger. That is when you can tear the terminal slip of your extensor mechanism. Or you can have a cut, a laceration. Or ball, ball sports, even tucking in sheets or a shirt. We've had an old um, gentleman and he just simply tucked his shirt into the back of his trousers and sustained a mallet. So don't worry, it normally doesn't happen that quickly, but just an example. Three types according to the Doyle's classification. Can be a partial interruption of the extensor tendon. Can be a complete disruption of the extensor tendon, that terminal slip. Or it can take a piece of the bone with an avulsion fracture. So how do we treat it? You will see that there are different types of splints that are made, even the good old POP. But because of the long time that the finger will have to be splinted, plaster of Paris can irritate the skin a bit. You have to actually put a bit of Vaseline on. So a splint is the best way. Remember, we don't include the PIPJ in this. This is simply to maintain extension of your DIP for eight weeks long. So this tendon actually, you are, you are waiting for this tendon ends to grow together if it is a partial disruption. 24-7, the splint needs to be kept on. Even, even at night, 24-7. If they take off the splint, they just wanted to, in the incorrect way, the way that you didn't tell them or educate them to, then the eight weeks start from the beginning again. So what is the correct way? The correct way to take the splint off is to place your finger flat on the table, try it in front of you, Remove the splint, don't lift your finger up, maintain that almost hyperextension of your DIP, then place the splint back on. And that is it. So the finger can actually not be measured for ROM. Because if you measure it for ROM, the tendon is off again. It's because it's so thin, that tendon, that terminal slip. That's why we are taking such good care of it. So, after the eight weeks, then you don't take off the splint yet, but nighttime splinting is continued. You can stop the nighttime splinting when the patient is able to maintain full DIP extension at the end of the day. So, meaning they even have to keep the splint in their pocket when they go to work. If they see the lag, you know, when the finger droops, it drops at the DIP. They have to put that splint back on. By the end of the day, if they can maintain that, then you know the work is done. There's surgery, for instance, if there's an avulsion, like you can see at the left bottom picture, they would actually put KY or mini screws to keep that bone in. Can you see that that bone is not fully making contact and there's actually a gap there. That means that there's a chance of, of non-union there. 
So you actually want to have bone on bone contact, um, but just, just for interest's sake. And after the surgery, splinting also for eight weeks. So what happens here? A swan neck deformity. Have you ever seen a finger where there's like hyperflexion in your DIP and extension, hyperextension at your PIP? Looks like a swan neck. Can you see the swan neck? So what happens here? So this is when, for instance, if there is an interruption of the terminal tendon, extensor tendon. Let's say, for instance, the terminal, like you can see, has been cut, mallet injury. Then the FDP flexes that distal part, and that gives you the swan's neck, right? Also, your central band on the extensor part works unopposed. So that extends the PIP. And that is why all the force, extensive force, goes to that PIP. And that is why you can get this injury. You can also get this injury in sports, rugby, soccer, where the finger actually gets stepped on. <laughs> Grind. Ouch. So you will see that the lateral bands migrate up in this injury. So conservative treatment for this. If you can passively correct the joint mode, so if you can flex the PIP, if you can extend the DIP, then conservative management is fine, can work. In a gutter splint, like the white one at the bottom, or an oval eight splint at the top left. But you can see that this, the gutter splint, the static extensive finger splint, has to be made in slight PIP flexion just to oppose that deformity. Also use a neoprene sleeve at the top, but that is in the beginning not strong enough to keep it. But it is also an option also to help with swelling, it's nice. Surgery, if you can't passively correct it, then you know doesn't matter how much you splint it, it's not going to work. After the operation, the gutter splint, so the gutter splint, same thing, static finger extension splint, night splinting only, and then you need to be, then you have to assess the finger. See how the ROM is progressing, and then you give your exercises. I hope you are all still following. Please leave a question in the chat if you have any questions. Boutonnier deformity, nice French word, boutonnier. This is the opposite of the swan neck. Boutonnier deformity is where all the extensive force is at the DIP. Your lateral bands migrate down bolally and it acts as a PIP flexor. Can you see how the proximal interphalangeal joint is flexed here? So it actually tightens up, the lateral bands tightens it up more. Can you also see that the central slip in the picture is disrupted? So there you know that is one of the causes of a boutonnier deformity. PIP is also flexed because of the FDS is unopposed. There's no competition for it because the central slip normally is the balancing act of the finger for the FDS. The PIP is initially passively correctable, but then if we don't manage it correctly, a contracture can develop. And if you find this finger very late, somebody comes to you with a boot on your deformity, you can't passively correct it, then you know it's surgery time, right? If it's been long, long standing, they actually have to do joint surgery. Look at the capsule, look at that tight oblique retinacular ligaments. Treatment. There you can see your oval eight splints. Very handy, but only if it is 
if it's a mild return year, right, or the end of your year. But normally a conservative, if you can passively correct it, you, what works really well is serial casting with POP. You see in the picture that the DIP is left free, is not included in your cost. The reason for that is very clever. If you give an exercise and you must give a flexion of your DIP exercise that they do often in the day, then it actually corrects the lateral band movement. It moves it up. It's clever, right? So in that way, it corrects the deformity itself. End stage neoprene sleeves can also work. Surgery, if you can't passively correct it, they will have to go in and take out adhesions and fix it there. They're after also a period of splinting. Now let's take a look at this person's hand hitting the wall. Where have you ever heard about a boxer's fracture? Well, in the picture at the top, this is a metacarpal neck fracture of the fifth finger. Can you see that the apex angulates to the top, the dorsum part, right? And this is the angulation that we are talking about, that the surgeons use to make a decision of if they should leave it, mobilize and rehab, or if they should place a K wire in and fix it. If there's more than 30 degrees of angulation, a weak grip. So you start off and you, your grip is weak. There's also a decreased active range of motion at the MPJ. More than 15 degrees of angulation, what happens is that there's a compensatory movement where your MPJ actually hyperextends. So obvious in boxing, hitting walls or doors can lead to these fifth neck metacarpal fractures. So because it happens, um, if somebody comes back and has a history of, um, of violence, so it's not the first time that they've hit their hand against a wall. What do you think? Is it worth fixing it the first time? Or is it worth fixing it the second time? This is the reason why the doctors often decide then to leave it. Because cosmetically, they complain. They complain that they don't have a knuckle on their MCPJ, that knuckle on their fifth finger. But functionally, it makes there is no significant difference between surgery and conservative management. So if they if they decide that this guy will hit the wall again, they will not often repair it. If it's if the angulation is more than 70 degrees, yes, no, they will. They will. Right here in the picture below, you can see uh, what is that bone? It's the ring finger. It's the neck. The fourth metacarpal neck fracture. And can you see that this one looks like it will require surgery as the positioning in it is not, is not adequate. So they will put a K wire in. But can you see that that apex can also nick the extensor tendon? And for that reason, they have to evaluate carefully. 